Finance me Committee meeting for Monday, November 7th. Uh, Madam Cla uh, Councilor Sullivan. Mr. Chairman, if I could, uh, I'd like to make a motion to take agenda item five out of order at this time. Second. Motion made and seconded to take item uh, number five first. All those in favor? All those opposed? Madam Clerk, please read item number five. Five, resolve that the director of the Brockton Council on Aging and member Richard Bath be invited to appear before a committee of this council to discuss the possible expansion of the Council on Aging Facilities. Invited, Janet Fistero, Director of Council on Aging, Richard Bath, Council on Aging member. Good evening, Ms. Fitzgerald, and uh, actually this uh, was filed by Council Monaghan, and he did call me just a short time ago, and he hurt his back at work today, so he won't be with us tonight, but he did ask to send us, send us hellos. Thank you very much. Um, good evening, and thank you all for inviting uh, Richard Bath and myself here tonight to talk about the expansion of the Council on Aging. Also with us tonight are my staff, members of the Board of Directors, and members of the Friends Board, and a few members from the Building Committee, and most important, my husband. <laughs> <laughs> So as you recall, I recently came before you with a request to fill a position, and I want to say thank you all very much. And at that time, I spoke with you all briefly about the projected growth of our elder population. Tonight, I am here to talk to you about the need for additional space. It is our plan to raise funds close to a million dollars to add on to the COA. As you all know, we will be kicking off our capital campaign on the 17th. Some may wonder why we need more space. Well, let me tell you some of the reasons why. Presently, Brockton has over 17,000 people aged 60 and older. We average over 100 visits a day. We serve over 4,000 meals a year, and that is with our meal program only running two days a week. This past year, we welcomed over 500 new members, and we are on track to hit the same number, if not more, this year. On occasion, we sadly have to turn people away because of space limitations. Another reason is that it is projected by 2020, there will be close to 20,000 elders in Brockton. That is a 20% increase. As we were, and still are bracing for the boom baby boomers to hit the elder network, we also need to brace for the millennials, which have surpassed the baby boomers, and the generation X's, which will not be as large a group. Although there is still little time before these groups become of age, the fact is they will, and we as a community need to be prepared. To give you some other numbers, according to the Donahue Institute of UMass Amherst, 45,661 residents turn 60 every year. This translates to 125 a day, five an hour, <laughs> or one every 12 minutes. Alice Bonner, the state's executive secretary of elder affairs, states the trends really should be alarming people if we're not prepared. We have this opportunity right now to think about our society and communities are going to look like, what our communities are going to look like 30 years from now. So, you know me, I like to sum things up. We are busting at the seams. We're gonna do our best to raise what we can but we are going to need the city to help us out. At this time, I'd like to show you what our plan looks like, and then Richard Bath will add some closing comments, and we will be happy to answer any questions you have. Easy. He's my easel guy. So, what you're looking at now is a drawing of the COA with the addition added on. Presently, we have 7,500 square feet. With the addition, we're going to add another 3,100, so it's going to give us um, over 10,000 square feet. Um, the addition is going to go right off the back of the center, you know, where we have 
the parties and bingo, we're going to go right out to the sidewalk. By doing that, we're going to, believe it or not, add 10 additional parking spaces to our 29 that we have already. We still are going to have major issues with parking. Okay. We have, oh, we have three easel guys, sorry. So we have Joe Medallo and John Kenny, who are part of the building committee as well. Um, so we'll, <laughs> we're looking to add an additional multi-purpose room, some other break, breakout rooms that we can use for classes, um, whatever we decide to do with it, bigger kitchen area, um, things like that. So in a nutshell, that's what we're looking at. We're excited to kick this off on the 17th. I hope to see all you folks there. And um, Richard? Thank you for having us tonight. Really appreciate this. Um, we've met with uh, some stakeholders in the city. We've met with uh, <coughs> Councillor Cruz. We've met with uh, Councillor Farwell. We've met with uh, Councillor Monaghan. We've met with the delegation up on Beacon Hill. We've met with the Old Colony Planning Council. We've met with uh, Rob May, the city planner. So to you know, get their input, uh, we met with Jay Condon to get his input. So we've been really trying to really put together a very solid plan to serve the most underserved population in the United States of America. Seniors are, for the, are the forgotten citizens of this country and that in Brockton is no different. It's not because we're a bad city, it's not because we're bad folk, is that we're worried about everything else in the sun. And I get that, and I get the budget, and I get all of this other thing. But the senior citizens are really underserved here. We are bursting at the seams here. We have the smallest council on aging in Plymouth county in, in terms of square feet, but we have 25% of all the senior citizens in Plymouth County. How does that work for us? So we really need to make this expansion. We really need to get out there and make it, make it work. You know, I got to tell you, I, I'm a senior citizen, as some others are on this who don't want to admit it yet, but come down and, and you know, and join. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's, it's something that we've really got to really take into consideration. Do we really want to be responsible for turning away a senior citizen because they can't get into the, get into the, uh, the council, because they can't park their car? Are we going to be responsible for that? I don't know about you guys, but I don't want to be part of that where they come in to, and they need to get the services that really is, is part of what their life is. You know, and we've turned people away of the Council on Aging, and we shouldn't be able to do that. They don't turn people away at the other councils on aging. So we do because we don't have the space. It's not because we don't want them. It's because we don't have the space here. So what we're planning is, is to increase this. We want to raise a million dollars. That's what it's going to cost. It's going to cost us a million dollars to build on to this thing and, and to upgrade the facility. The facility is not upgraded yet. We need more. We need um, better technology. We need more, we need more help. 25% of the senior citizen population in Plymouth County, and we have three people, three full-timers. You go to the other ten cities and towns, and they have seven, eight, nine. Look at we thank you for the, that third person. Honest to God, we really do. It's been really a godsend for Janice, because before it was just Janice and Michelle and, and Dottie just trying to get things done, and, and a whole host of, of volunteers. But we really, really, really need your help here. So we've come here to talk to you about trying to get some help for us. And I've come here also hopefully, to try to make you feel guilty, okay? Try to make you feel guilty a little bit. You know, you know uh, I remember when, and having several conversations with people, you know, we go through stages, you know, uh, at, at a point we become our parents, all right? We sit around and we talk about all of our ailments, we become our parents. Now we're in the stages where we become our children. And our children want to know where we are every night, every night, and people need and want to take care of it because we need those services to take care of our senior population. Look at, don't leave them out. Please don't leave them out. Help us 
uh, any way you possibly can. We, we, we have our kickoff event on November the 17th. I, we would love for all of you to come down and, and, and see what the, the presentations uh, that's going to be made and meet and greet with the seniors. So in, in summation, just we need your help. We can't do it alone. And I got to tell you, these folk sitting right here deserve a chance to have a really good senior experience. They really do, like we do. Okay, so I thank you very much for, for your time. I really appreciate it. Councilor Farwell. <laughs> Richard, I have to tell you, that was very good. I assumed we were gonna have one more elderly person while you were speaking, but you didn't do 12 minutes, so that's good. <laughs> Councilor Farwell. Yes. Uh, my appreciation for that presentation, and, and as some of you may know, I have met with uh, Mr. Bath and Ms. Fitzgerald and, and some others. Um, there's another option that I'd like the council and the city to, to consider. We have spent many, many hours debating the Rock Stadium, Campanelli Stadium, and the Shaw Center. And we've debated back and forth about Brockton 21st Century Corporation and what should be done and what might be done and what should have been done and what didn't happen. And, and I think any fair assessment is that that complex did not work out mm -hmm. to the benefit of the citizens as it was originally planned. No. Not laying any fault on anyone. There were grand hopes. It, it didn't happen. And in thinking about what would work there, I think... Janice and Dick have just outlined the fact that we're going to have a built-in clientele, if you will, that needs services. People who have continued to live here, pay their taxes, and have not benefited from the Rocks Stadium or the Shaw Center, but maybe they could. And what I'd like the council to consider is to work with the Council on Aging as they go forward with their, their fundraiser, but consider March 2021 when the current lease, if I've read the documents correctly, will expire for the current uh, tenants, and to turn the Shaw Center over to the Council on Aging. And by then, if I've read the documents correctly, the naming rights for the Shaw Center will have expired, so it could become the Mary Cruz Kennedy Senior Center or Senior Complex. Now, expanding into a building like that will open up all kinds of possibilities. Fundraising possibilities, perhaps with, with adding a staff member, a facility manager to, to the uh, Council on Aging staff. You could have various events there, and instead of the money coming in to a private tenant that is occupying that building, it would come into a revolving account for the Council on Aging. Uh, the parking is I think exemplary up there. It's located, as you've probably read my comments in the paper, it's right next to the fire station, so if God forbid we had a medical emergency, we're, we're right where we need to be in terms of having fire and rescue personnel respond. Um, for all of the reasons that have been articulated, we need to plan ahead. We've got four years to do the strategic planning and the financial planning that could make this a reality. Emphasis could make this a reality, because I, I gr give great deference to the mayor and his position. He should be involved in this. He'll have his administrative team look at it if, if it's something that we, we deem credible, and we can plan. Uh, my understanding is the bond for the stadium will be paid off by next April or May, so that if some small borrowing needed to take place at some point in the future, the debt service should be able to handle it. Um, the second piece of that, which has nothing to do with the Council on Aging, is that the stadium would go to the Brockton Public Schools. The schools already have an exceptional facility management team in place taking care of all of our school buildings, and we also have uh, a community schools facility rental program so that if the MIAA wanted to hold baseball tournaments or something else at the stadium, the school department could handle that and the revenues would come in to them as they do now with facility rentals. So um, I don't know how my colleagues feel about it. I've thrown it out there. Um, 
I'd be interested in hearing from, from Janice and Dick about it and from my colleagues. And if it's something that could become a reality, I, I think the city would finally, after many, many years, get the benefit of that property and those facilities uh, that the residents deserve and the taxpayers deserve. Um, and with that, I'd, I'd defer to, uh, if I could, Mr. Chairman, I'd defer to, uh, to uh, Richard or Janice to comment. Uh, if you do, and if you don't, I mean, that's a lot to have been thrown at you in one night. I don't think necessarily you may not have had formed an opinion on the viability of that at this point, so. I think it's a very interesting idea. I think there are, the, there are a lot of things that need to happen with this. We need to do a walkabout over there to see uh, what it's like. We also need to have our building department take a look at if the city's gonna take it over, the building department to look at it, to see what infrastructure inside needs to be done. You're right, we would have to have extra um, uh, staff members on there because if we're going to use it as a facility rental, I, I, think, it's a, I, th I think it's a very interesting idea. I, I, I would support that idea. Um, but I also would like to have more information on it first before we, we go forward with it, you know. And, and you guys, this council, has got to agree to make that, to make that happen. So you haven't even had the dialogue. And I, and I really appreciate what Councilor Falwell has brought to the table because it really is an interesting idea. And it's something that we had, we had in, in our meetings uh, at the council, we talked about trying to find a different building a larger building, but we couldn't come up with one in the city that, you know, would, would be able to take us, you know, pretty right away. Because, you know, the one thing that we don't want to do uh, is to displace our seniors. Remember, resistance to change is hard. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we, we, get, we get sort of complacent in what we, what we do. We get used to what we do, you know. And so to just uproot and without any, you know, knowledge or, or having a game plan, uh, we also are in the process of uh, trying to create a strategic plan going forward, and we're going to need that, you know, even if we, even if this doesn't come to fruition, uh, even for the, for, the, for the building and the extension that we, we want to do it. But I, I just want to add something else to what uh, Councilor Falwell was talking about, you know, going forward with the number of people. There are 72 million baby boomers. That's us. We're getting older. And so that's going to increase the size of our senior population. We're going to start to retire, you know. And so I think we need to make sure that, you know, during those, during those years where we're going to retire, we're not playing catch-up. We shouldn't play catch-up. We can't play, continue to play catch-up for the senior citizens in, in this country and in the city and in, this, in the Commonwealth. We just can't. And so, you know, but I think it's an interesting idea. We're open to it. We're still going to go forward with our, with, with our plans. So what we have here is plan A and alternative plan B. But that plan B has got to resonate with you guys, not us. I mean, we're, we're here as renters, actually. So go ahead. And I agree 100% with what you just said, Richard. Um, it's certainly a very interesting proposal. Um, we're going to stay very open-minded to see where this goes. Um, what I would ask, though, is that you all keep in mind that the center doesn't belong to me. It doesn't belong to you. It belongs to the seniors. So when we get to the point where we have to make decisions or what we're doing, the seniors need to be a part of the planning. Otherwise, I want no part of it myself. But it is a great idea. It, it offers a lot of opportunities, a lot of collaborations with agencies that deal with elder issues. We could truly become a focal point in the community. No other community would be as wonderful as us taking mm -hmm. care of our elders. Um, there's a lot of, lot of opportunities, so um, thank you. You know, second, Councilor? Thank you. Councilor Barnes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Ms. Fitzgerald, I, I just, that's actually uh, Councilor Fowler's idea. Uh, it's really ambitious, and I, I, I read it before. I did see it, and I thought about it. But even just sitting here and then looking at the renderings here um, and seeing how the plan is to expand the kitchen and the pantry area and then the little library uh, resource area there, 
had there ever, and I just thought about this, had there ever been any idea or any plan to maybe build up um, and up and out or and or up or out? And I didn't know, Ms. Casteri's here, you know, doing, um, you know, building evaluations. Is, is that building a candidate to go up a, a level or is that something that's ever yep. been discussed? Yep, so that was discussed. Um, by building out, we're going out as far as we can. Mm -hmm. Building up was going to be be probably very expensive. Okay. So we opted with trying to keep it as simple as possible. Um, in those rooms, the way it's um, drawn there can be changed as we get closer to the project to whatever we want it to be. I see, I see, okay. All right, I was just, just asking strategic, thank you. the cost involved with that, we would have to install an elevator. I mean, an elevator point. is really cost prohibitive. Right, right. You know, they're, they're, uh, uh, elevators alone. Are oh. $250,000, Right. True. And okay. it, would have to, it would have to be a larger elevator because if we had um, seniors who were in wheelchairs and whatever, sure. so it would have to be almost like a room. And so we're talking a lot of money. Okay. I would much rather spend that money on something, something sure. else on the ground level. Okay. Yeah, I, I just wanted to see if that had ever been discussed. I, I don't think I ever saw it come up. So, but thank you. Thank you so much for your diligence. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Ranieri. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good evening, Janice, and good evening, uh, Dick. Good to have you uh, both here, and uh, thank you for the, uh, for the presentation. And, of course, um, as a member of the City Council, and yes, I am growing older, and I do need to come down and join. Um, I, I wholeheartedly uh, support whatever you try to do whether you know, it be it with, with this center here or if we can even take a, a stronger look even at what uh, Councillor Fowle has brought uh, to the table as well. And um, in, in respect to Councillor Fowle, I, I appreciate him even bringing this up. And he, he contacted me over the weekend because he knows that the, um, the stadium and, and the center itself belongs or, or is a part of Ward 3. And naturally, um, you know, I appreciate him being Council Lodge to bring that idea to me. And he, and he wanted to know my thoughts and, and I was, uh, uh, pretty much probably um, thinking to myself, uh, and I did say to him a at the end, why didn't I think of that, you know? <laughs> um, for all the many times I've said, and this is what we take a look at, even with that facility, is the fact that it, it was built to do what it did. It, it did its job well as we hosted, you know, the Rocks team here. We still do. Um, it, it became a, a center where people could rent the facility to whatever, whatever their function may be. Um, but in some cases, that never got off the ground the way that it should have. And I would have to say, I mean, not that I want to say, but, you know, it, it ran its course in the 10 or 11 or 12 years that I always said it would. Um, and I was on the school committee then when they did, when we did deed the ground and property to, to the city. And now we're at the point even after these few years, it, we, we're always struggling. And, um, and you're right, Dick, you know, I mean, if, if something was to, to take place there, it has to come and, and it has to lie of a decision of, of, this, of this council. And, and I don't want to hear even the mayor to say, well, it's all up to what the B21st wants to do or the 21st Century Corp. But I have my own opinion of that because I think council, it's almost time. Council, let's stick to the Council on Aging Building. Yeah, I, I, I am. I, I'll get to it. I'll get to it. But my theory is that the fact that the facility, the way that it is built, and the adequate room that you would have there, would definitely make a great, great facility to you know to even have um, the council on aging there. And I agree with the the parking, more parking than than you would have even downtown. Um, that area bothers me as it is with you know with the parking, um, uh, seeing the way that it is. Anytime you have a function of anyone that crosses the street, so I, I mean I think it's a great idea, and I just I do want you to keep an open mind on it um, as much as that. Yeah, we have to do what we can to help you here with this location as, as well. But um, I'm all in favor of whichever, whichever spot, but hopefully we can take a, take a look at that idea as well. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Yeah, we are going to keep a, an open mind to it, but we still, uh, you know, and if this comes to fruition and, and go by the grace of God, this happens, okay, and we do get it, we're still going to need money. Exactly. We're still going to need money. Okay, and so we're still going to have to go forward with, yeah, you know, it's no matter what we do, there's a dollar sign involved in this, whether we take over that building. We don't know what that building is like inside, but we're still going to need money. That's one of the reasons why we're going to go forward with the November 17th. And with your permit, we're, gonna, we're also going to 
because now it's out in the newspapers, we're going to talk about that on November the 17th as well as alternate plan B, maybe. Okay? Thank you, Councilor Neary. Thank you. Anyone else, Councilors? Mr. Chairman, I just had one question. Councilor Sullivan. Good evening. How are you? Thank you so much for being here and, and for what you do uh, for the seniors. And thank you for the men and women that showed up tonight. It's really wonderful. In terms of the parking, Janice, you mentioned that with this configuration, and I support it 100%, um, and I think when Councilor Farwell's idea is something to think about um, going forward in the future, but real time now, present day, it's this and the 17th next week, and I expect you're gonna see, if not all of us, most of us there. Um, in terms of the parking, the 10 spots, which is, which is great, are you also gonna be able to use parking from St. Patrick's and from the Y? So presently now, we um, overflow cars, we can park at the church. We have an agreement with them. Um, we had discussed reaching out to the YMCA to see if we could take over some of their parking behind us, um, but haven't had that conversation yet. Okay, but it's definitely in the queue, I mean, in terms mm -hmm. of that. Okay, yes. wonderful, thank you. See you on the 17th. Yep. Thank Actually, you, if you want to give the details of the 17th to the people at home, so it's November 17th, so what time? It's November 17th from 5 to 7.30. It's by invitation only. It's not open to the public. Um, we Unless have somebody <laughs> wants to bring a check for a million dollars. Exactly. <laughs> we will have pens so ready. Uh, Where could somebody uh, send a donation if they wanted to? So if somebody wants to make a donation to the building fund, they would send it to the COA My Attention, and it would be made out to Friends of the Brockton COA. Okay. Um, so, yep, 17th, 5 to 7.30, cocktail reception. And we have already raised about $60,000 before kicking off the campaign, so... That's all I have Great. to say. Good. Thank you. So, Chairman, again, Janice, if someone wanted to contact you, what's the phone number if they wanted to chat with you in private about a potential donation? Um, they could call the Council on Aging, 508-580-7811. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Great. And sustain a motion? Motion for a favorable recommendation back to the full Council. Second. Second. Motion made and seconded to recommend favorably to the full City Council. All those in favor? All those opposed? Recommended favorably. Thank you very much and good luck and we'll see you on the 17th. Thank you. Thank Item number one. Item number one, order, acceptance and expenditure of a grant in the amount of 40,500 from the Massachusetts Department of Environmental Protection Recycling Dividend and Small Scale Initiative Grant to the City of Brockton Public Works Refuse Division Recycling Dividend and Small Scale Initiative Grant Fund. Invited, Honorable Mayor Bill Carpenter, John A. Condon, Chief Financial Officer, Lawrence Rowley, DPW Commissioner, and Pat Sullivan, Refuse Contract Admin. Good evening, Mr. Rowley. Good evening. Um, Councilors, this is something that we apply for every year and Pat Sullivan does a great job and we usually get this. So it's a no match grant, just like it says, for recyclable um, containers. Favorable recommendation back to full second. council. Second. Second. Motion made second and to recommend favorably to the full city council. All those in favor? All those opposed? Recommended favorably. Item number two. Order, acceptance and expenditure of a grant in the amount of 88,500 from Massachusetts Department of Environmental Protection, Massachusetts Electric Vehicle Incentive Program, Phase Three Program, to the City of Brockton Department of Public Works, Massachusetts Electric Vehicle Incentive, Phase Three Program Grant Fund. Invited, Honorable Mayor Bill Carpenter, <coughs> J John A. Condon, Chief Financial Officer, Lawrence Rowley, DPW Commissioner, Pat Sullivan, Refuse Contract Admin. Good evening, Mr. Good evening Rowley. Again. Councilors, this is um, phase three. We've already done phase one. We purchased or leased one car, phase two. We've leased two cars, and this one, this phase three is um, 10 cars. Um, it's 75,000 for the cars and 13,500 for two more chargers. Motion to recommend favorably to second. the full Second. Council. Motion made and seconded to recommend favorably to the full city council. All those in favor? All those opposed? Recommended favorably to the full city council. Thank you, Mr. Thank Rowley. you, Thank you, Mr. Rowley. Item number three. Resolve 
to invite Mr. George Durant, the Transformative Development Initiative Fellow from Mass Development, to discuss the first six months of his accomplishments in the three-year project. Invited, Mr. George Durant, TDI, Fellow Mass Development. Uh, Councilor Beauregard, I believe you filed this. Yes, I did. Thank you, Mr. President. I filed this because uh, George has been going around town, uh, particularly downtown, and uh, doing some research, connecting up with the um, business people of the city in, in that area, uh, addressing some d concerns that took place, unfortunately, this summer with the explosion, and uh, also uh, addressing the um, other concerns of I would say nonprofits and uh, local uh, government offices in, in the area. And he has a couple of things he'd like to talk to us about. And I always say for, to him to emphasize the fact that he is not an employee of the city, that he's here to come and help us and, um, how would I say, kickstart downtown. Thank you. Good evening, Mr. Durant. Good evening. Uh, pleasure to be here. Uh, so, as, as uh, the Councillor said, my name is George Duranti and I am the Transformative Development Initiative Fellow or TDI Fellow for Downtown Brockton. Uh, I am an employee of Mass Development and fully funded through Mass Development. Uh, first, there's, there's a few things that I'd like to update you on regarding the past six months uh, of some of the accomplishments that the TDI partnership has made. Uh, first and foremost, I do want to say that we do have a, a website. Uh, that we, we would love to start directing folks towards uh, regarding updates uh, to figure out the, the latest and greatest of what's happening downtown. Uh, and that, that's funded through Mass Development and it's, it's uh, operated under the co-urbanized platform. Uh, what I could do if, if, uh, if the council would like is, is send an email out with a link uh, and, and if you feel appropriate. Uh, you could distribute to your constituents. But for those at home right now, uh, the, the link is coerb, that's C-O-U-R-B dot C-O slash Brock, B-R-O-C-K, T-D-I. And if you, if you follow us on that website, uh, you can get all the updates that we send out when special projects happen and events. So one of, one of the key points for the TDI partnership is that it is a partnership. Uh, and, and over the past six months, we've expanded that core partnership uh, to include W.B. Mason and the Brockton Redevelopment Authority. Uh, and that helps us bring in some, some uh, obviously a, a hugely important player in the downtown community with W.B. Mason uh, and also the, the Brockton Redevelopment Authority and its emphasized role with the new, uh, newly adopted urban revitalization plan uh, from DHCD. Uh, some of the other pieces that we're working on uh, th through Mass Development and the partnership is technical assistance. Uh, we have three ongoing pieces of technical assistance that we're working through the scope at this time uh, on, and uh, we expect these to start uh, going into the action phase around January. Uh, the first is best retail practices. So we have uh, a mass development consultant that's coming on board to work with six businesses in downtown uh, to work on their, their best practices in terms of their window display, uh, maybe a strategy for moving forward, enhancing marketing, things like that. You should see a visual impact uh, once this work has been completed, uh, which should wrap up in, in April or, or March of uh, the spring of next year. In addition, uh, we have a consultant coming on board to uh, engage in urban realm and public space activation planning. Uh, they'll be looking at the TDI district in the downtown holistically and identifying some opportunities for programming and activities uh, that will enhance the visual feel and help to uh, engage a lot of the community and workforce uh, of the downtown. That's uh, pretty much on the same timeline, January to the spring. Uh, and finally, we have another consultant examining the expansion of the historic district downtown. Uh, the, the layered approach uh, that uh, Rob May has, has really kind of led the charge on here uh, with Chapter 40R and HDIP and the DIF uh, that's, that's pretty well received around the Commonwealth. Uh, and the expansion of the historic district adds one more piece of the pie there uh, to encourage development in the downtown. In addition, 
Uh, I am working on managing the Urban Agenda Grant that the city received, it was $50,000 uh, from the Executive Office of Housing and Economic Development, and that is to engage in the incubator feasibility study for a co-working space, commercial kitchen, uh, and restaurant incubator. That work is ongoing at this point, uh, and we're expecting pre preliminary findings from Ninigret Partners, who, who is the consultant for that work. Uh, and uh, we hope to keep you updated as that report becomes finalized. Uh, we have worked with the Fuller Craft Museum and the Metro South Chamber of Commerce uh, to launch a young professionals group. Uh, we have started steering committee meetings on that uh, and expect that to roll out this winter as well. Uh, Councillor Lally uh, will hopefully be participating in, in some of these meetings and helping to shape how this, uh, this group is, uh, what the mission is and what the organizational structure is. So we're really looking forward to that. Uh, to give Are you up. intimating that the rest of us don't belong in that group? <laughs> <laughs> There's no age limit, <laughs> but, the, but the steering committee, uh, we, we've hand chosen uh, young leaders in the community that we, we think uh, represent a, a, a diverse constituency. Uh, and one, one of the first things that, that that young professionals group is going to do is uh, construct a, a parklet. Uh, and for those of you who do not know what a parklet is, uh, it's, it's, it's kind of an innovative uh, public planning space activation tool that's, that's used across the country uh, and across the Commonwealth. Peabody uh, has used there for the past year. So it's really an extension of the sidewalk uh, to create an innovative public space to hold events. Um, typically, you'll match it with something like a coffee shop, like Elvira's. Uh, where folks can get their coffee and then go sit in this, this space that will typically have plantings and things like that around it um, just to have a unique experience. Uh, so we're planning on running a pilot of that uh, in November, putting it away for the, for the winter, uh, and then coming up with some additional programming and enhancements for the spring and summer uh, within the downtown. Uh, let's see, we're working with individual property owners. A uh, good example is Bill Hogan and Hoagie's Hobby Shop. Uh, I've been working very closely with him, um, trying to get him set up with an eBay account, for example. Those are some of the small things that we're doing uh, to help him uh, expand his business footprint and increase marketing and, and uh, earning potential. Uh, working with developers like uh, Ted Carmen on 93 Center Street and, uh, and some other folks that might be poking around at different opportunities in downtown. Um, giving them tours and things like that to let them know what's available here and what's, what's in the pipeline. Uh, we've been working uh, with the Mayor's Homelessness Task Force. Uh, one of the things that we're doing is distributing health and safety resource cards uh, throughout the business community and nonprofit community of the downtown so that they know exactly who to call if they're having an issue uh, with, uh, with homeless individuals or panhandling or, or crime uh, or and safety related issues. So. Uh, that's certainly one thing we're, we're looking at. Uh, and we're continuing engagement with stakeholders of all types. Uh, every day, or every, every day, every week, I'm, I'm speaking with a new organization, whether it's a church, a nonprofit, a new business, uh, whatever it may be. We're, we're trying to keep that dialogue open and going because the more partners we have at the table, uh, the more successful this will be. And uh, I know that I've spoken with, with many of you on, on separate occasions, but uh, I, I would love to connect with uh, all of you at some point uh, to hear your thoughts on downtown and, uh, and help, help you share in the vision of, of what's uh, moving forward here. Thank you. Council Borgard? Well, first of all, thank you. This is one of the reasons why I called you up, and like I, I had mentioned to you, you know, at the beginning, that we would call you up more often because the, the biggest disappointment in this city is, well, we get plenty of misinformation, but we don't always get the right information. So tonight you've demonstrated a whole lot of positives that are going on. And prior to your arrival, there had been, you know, a few individuals that were somewhat assigned to addressing downtown. And I just wanted to ask you a couple of things. One of them, we were curious about the benches. Another thing that had um, bothered us, and again, we're not pointing the finger at you, was the dead trees that we had that were supposed to be hydrangeas, I believe. And then I'm um, wondering about barrels because we're still fighting the um, trash everywhere. And of course, that's not, none of these are your fault, but we're just wondering where those are going. Oh, and the street lights, because that happens to be a big thing too. The street lights being out, Councillor? Well, the, the, a lot of, a couple of the businesses have said that some of them aren't on, 
and that they're not getting enough light, um, particularly, and I'll, 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 I'll name one uh, place, the camp, you know, um, what are they called? The um, boxing ring. Um, uh, my, Kep, 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 yeah, Kep, the Piano, building? Kep, yes. And they, they seem to be having a lot of problem with that when the people leave. And now, since we just changed the clocks, it's darker. And that was a concern, you know, darker earlier, I should say. And uh, that was one of, you know, the four situations that people had brought up. So I was wondering if you could highlight that, please. Yeah, those, those are certainly things that uh, haven't been involved when involved with yet, but I could be, uh, to be an advocate for the folks in downtown. I would, one, one thing that I do want to push is, is the C-Click Fix app that the city has. Mm -hmm. uh, I've used that a few times to get some spray paint and graffiti removed. Uh, it was fantastic. Within two days, uh, staff was out there and, and, and cleaning it up. So uh, that's probably the quickest and most effective way to do it. But I, again, I'm happy to advocate on, on uh, folks if, if they're having issues like that. You all set? Yes, I'll open up to my colleagues. But again, I want to thank you. And uh, again, you know, like I said, we'll, we'll keep on, you know, inviting you up because we like to hear good news and we're hoping that you'll have more. But also I want to mention at this time too that uh, when we had that unfortunate explosion on uh, Main Street in between, um, what was it, VFW Parkway and School Street, and uh, the, a couple of businesses really suffered, and George went out there and informed them about the various opportunities they could have to help them along, you know, during, uh, how would I say, rebuilding, recleaning, and uh, reopening their, their businesses, and I want people to realize that these, these services are out there, so I want to thank you for that, George. Thank you, Councillor. Yeah. Councillor Razak. Thank you. Good evening, Mr. Durante. Um, quick question: You're, is it are you, are you just really in charge of downtown, like the Main Street area, or do you go down to the end? Like, do, are you in communication with businesses as far as like Campello, Montello? So, so one of the the strategies with TDI is to take a hyper focused geographic area and concentrate a lot of resources into it. So, my my jurisdiction, if you will, uh, is essentially from Irving's Hardware. Uh, down to Tambu on Main Street, so it's very, it's about a five block area. Uh, and I go down to the train tracks, just the other side of the train tracks, because the police station is included. Uh, and and a, a boat up to uh, the Frederick Douglass Park. So it is a specific area? Yes, very. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Councillor. Anyone else? I'd entertain a motion. Motion to recommend move favorably. favorably. To second. <laughs> motion made and seconded to recommend favorably to the full city council. All those in favor? All those opposed, recommended favorably to full city council. Thank you, Thank you. for your information. Thank you very much. You. Item number four. Resolve to invite Jesse Pack, coordinator of the COPE Center, to discuss the policies and practices of the clean syringe distribution, a background on the history of other services you provide, the safeguards in place with the programs, and the plans for future programs regarding substance abuse. Invited, Honorable Mayor Bill Carpenter, Jesse Pack, coordinator of the COPE Center. Council Beauregard. Thank you, Mr. President. Yes, I uh, went to speak to Jesse, and apparently um, the CEO of BAMSI needs to be the individual to present in, in front of a governing body, as, he, as it was referred. So I contacted uh, Mr. Simonelli, and we expect him on the 21st, so I could ask that we could postpone this to the next Second. Finance Committee meeting in November. Thank you. Motion made and seconded to postpone this to the November 21st meeting. All those in favor? All those opposed? Postpone till the 21st. And uh, Ms. Peters, too, could you make sure that the invitation goes to Anthony Simonelli at uh, BAMSI? Will do. Item number six. Resolve, the mayor or his designee, the police chief and fire chief or their designees, the chairman of the license commission or his designee, the executive director of the board of health and the superintendent of buildings be invited to appear before committee of the city council to discuss ongoing code enforcement activities, available staffing as well as specific objectives for the next fiscal year. Invited, Honorable Mayor Bill Carpenter and or his designee, John Crowley, police chief and or his designee, Michael Williams, fire chief and or his designee, Henry Tartaglia, 
Chairman, License Commission, and or his designee, Louis Tartagala, Jr., Board of Health Director, James Kassiri, Superintendent of Buildings. Uh, I did receive communication from Mr. Henry Tartaglia that he was ill and could not make it tonight. Uh, Councilor Farwell. Yeah, thank you. I'll, I'll be brief. Uh, maybe I could start uh, because I think uh, Lieutenant LeGrice, uh, you have been uh, designated to be the spokesperson. Uh, and I, I did see you out today towing vehicles from uh, an area down on Main Street. Um, and at the end of this, I'm going to ask that this be referred to public safety because I think the mm -hmm. public safety committee wants to get together with people and devise some type of a more comprehensive approach. But uh, have we trained anyone specifically for code enforcement at the police department or is it catch as catch can when people are available? No, we have approximately um, 14 or 15 officers that are uh, trained in, in code enforcement and out there doing code enforcement on a weekly basis. Okay, now when you were last here, there was some perhaps valid criticism that we need to make sure that you know how many vehicles are allowed at a uh, garage repair, uh, on garage repair premises, uh, the hours of operation. But what else do you look for? What, what, what do you go in and actually inspect for the other ordinance provisions that are present? There are other ordinance people like the fire department gets involved in that uh, with regards to hazardous waste and things like that. Um, we're primarily charged with the hours of operation, making sure that the uh, number of vehicles are on the property, that no, we can take care of trash that's on the property and things like that. Um, that's primarily what we do with regards to garage licenses and repair licenses. Then, then you don't go in and check to see if they have a log, if repairs in excess of $250 have been made? Yes, we do. We you go in to check to that. make sure that the, all the cars have a repair order assigned to them, um, that um, anything over, to, you're right, over $250 has to be registered and kept track of uh, for vehicles on the property. Yes, we do check their logs, their licenses, the uh, number of vehicles on the property, but when it comes to hazardous material and stuff like that, that's usually deferred to the fire department. All right, and who enforces the provision that if there are five or more vehicles, the vehicles parked outside have to be on macadam or concrete? The police department would be Ple part you of You do? That. Yes, we would be part of that with regards to the uh, number of vehicles and how they're there. That's the reason we moved those uh, vehicles today from Main and Temple Street. Okay, the, the last time that you were in, I had some photographs and I'm not going to go through them because again, I think we can get more done in public safety. But on East Main Street, there is a property which backs up to North Montello Street. Mm -hmm. And uh, unfortunately, they have a number of vehicles, quite a number of vehicles that are packed out in a grassy area so that if there is any leakage, if there is a, a problem with groundwater contamination, we're not going to be doing anything about it. And I, I, I just am curious as to why, because it's so prominent, why someone wouldn't stop and take action on that. We have. We've spoken to the owner. The owner of that property is Mr. A1. We've spoken to him and he has begun to remove all of those vehicles. We don't go in and just start towing vehicles. The, Mr. V's down uh, that was at Temple and Main Street, I visited that premises. Uh, last Thursday night was the fifth time that I've been to the premise. We go there, we tell them what they need to do in order to operate properly, and then we give them some time to do it. Um, maybe with Mr. V's, I was a little um, late in getting things going, mainly because the summer was very busy for me, as Council Fowell knows. So um, normally five visits is a lot, but in the fifth one we told him, he had till Saturday to remove those vehicles, or we would be there on Monday to tow those vehicles. Monday we went in, today we went in, we towed all the vehicles off the property. He's not a happy man, but I really feel that we were more than fair in him. The problem that we have that this needs to get to public safety is that when I go into Mr. V's and he points across the street to another dealership that is operating a repair license that has been there for years, and I walk across the street and there are no provisions on his license, now we're enforcing things unequally, and that is something that I am not really happy about doing. I think these things should be um, the same for everybody, enforced properly for everybody, and it makes it very hard when you can actually point across the street, and I walk over there, and the guy had, um, he had a number of cars, 
but no hours of operation. And at this point, I was telling him that he was operating outside his hours. Mm -hmm. um, and then I walk across the street. They're operating, but they don't have any hours listed. So the audit that you called for back in August, which apparently is, I assume is not complete yet, um, that really needs to be done. What we've started to do in the police department, I've taken all those police officers and we're starting to divide, uh, divide the number of repair shops up amongst, uh, amongst those officers. So they, we, they will be assigned to certain garages that they'll get to know the owner, they'll know the people, they'll know who's coming and, and we can follow these things a little bit more closely. Understand, the Detective Bureau, in, in conjunction with everything else that we do, every major crime in the city, uh, investigating every major crime in the city, okay, um, truly all the way down to dog bites that we got last week, um, add in there that we have 75 uh, class one and two licenses for new and used cars that we oversee. We oversee every alcoholic restaurant, every package store in the city of Brockton, and you folks have probably don't even know this, have given out in excess of 160 garage licenses in the city of Brockton. That's probably a little excessive, but, but that is what we are, we are ch tasked with keeping track of, okay? Um, as well as all the narcotics in the city and every major crime and gang, gang stuff. Um, it's a monumental task. I think we're doing a great job at it. But the biggest thing that this board has to do, I believe, is get that to public safety so we can decide on what every garage. It should be a, a standard form that everybody fills out. Everybody should have to fill out the same thing. Hours or operations. How many cars can you allow on your property? Well, well, let, me, let me interrupt for a minute. There, my understanding is there is a standard form. So you're saying in the city clerk's office for the city of Brockton, on those two establishments that you just mentioned, there is absolutely no paperwork indicating what their hours of operation are? I have not gone and reviewed their, their thing. What I review is they're issued a license by the city. And all that on that license is supposed to be all the stipulations that they have. Mr. That's, Chairman. And it has if to be. I, if I could, I, I, I don't think it's, it's, uh, it's proper form or, or really professional not to have the city clerk here to talk about this. We learned this lesson before. I co-filed this resolve in May with Council Farwell. When, and I chair public safety. So when this gets sent back, okay. I'd respectfully ask that Tony Zioli, the city clerk, be invited. Because it's really not fair to talk about what the clerk's office may do or may, we're not having the man here. It's not fair. Thank you. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I agree. Uh, if you, now, $75,500 was appropriated for license enforcement. Yes. Do, do you know how much we've expended from that so far since July 1st? and where it, where it was spent? I think most of it has been sent in visiting all these garage licenses and reviewing all these licenses, uh, to be honest with you, Mr. Fowell. Um, I haven't checked recently. I would say we're probably at maybe 35% of that budget being spent. Okay, is there a log item made when we were on the department? If we stopped somewhere and we did something, there's a log item made and Lieutenant LeGrice is yeah. down in South Main Street towing cars, is that correct? Yes, what we've begun doing also is we've uh, begun a spreadsheet in the detective bureau where every detective can go into the drive, enter what they did on that date, where they visited, and what, what was found on that date at that location, and what, what they took to remedy the situation if there was anything wrong. Were they, were they told to get in compliance? You know, is a comp are we going to file a complaint or whatever it's going to do? So we've, we've done that stuff, and now we're assigning people so that we can keep track of, we know who's going to which establishments. Okay, I, then in preparation for the, the public safety meeting and in conjunction with this resolve, I'd like you to bring a printout of the log items for 2015 and calendar year 2015 and 2016 from January 1 through October 31st so we can get a flavor for how much we've done in terms of code enforcement, what action's been taken, what's been logged, what hasn't been logged, because now we'll start, we'll start dealing with, in some data instead of, we all give anecdotal comments about what's being done and yet I drive around and you know, I'm still convinced that we have more to do, but I think the hard data will tell us. The other thing I'd like to know if you would uh, is how many cases have we filed at the housing court or Brockton District Court for code violations. I know that was quite prominently done under the Harrington and Balzotti administration. I'd like to know how many cases have been filed by Brockton uh, at Housing and Brockton District Court. And with that, I, uh, I will complete my uh, questioning and I'll move later to refer this to public safety. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Barnes. 
Well, I, I don't know if he wanted Lieutenant LeGrice to answer that. that uh, he question? just took notes on what he's going to bring, I believe. Correct? Oh, okay. Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so you mentioned earlier uh, that when you go in, for instance, like a situation today or, or, uh, when you uh, visited this business and if you find something that's hazardous or um, some materials or something that needs to be removed, how, how does that work with the fire department? And maybe I should probably ask Chief Williams, how does that work if you're um, summoned to a location where um, they're having to remove things and then you see, you know, oil or whatever would constitute hazardous materials. How, how does that work? I have a hazardous material officer. Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. You have one designated person or you have yes. a, a fleet That's of people? Captain Williams in my Fire Prevention Bureau. Okay. okay. Um, he handles probably 95% of the hazardous material issues okay. that our department has. Uh, Okay, and how often does that ha how often has that happened? Kind of like what Councillor Fowler was asking, like what, how how many times do you guys have to go out like that? Council, it'd be hard to put a number on that. Okay, it, it depends. I mean, it may go two or three months with nothing being found, okay. um, and then there may be a spree where he's out, you know, two or three times a week checking on different, you know, fluid spills or what have you. Okay, and. Um, the cost of all of these things. So, if seventy-five thousand and some change uh, has been designated to that, I part, do not have a line item in my budget for specific code enforcement. It's done through my fire prevention bureau, so that's part of their duties and part of the budget. Okay. In that aspect. Okay. So, would you? Um, actually, no. I'll, I'll leave that for also public safety. Maybe even, you know, seeing if there's some kind of. Um, not a punishment, but some kind of fine, a consequence to the owner uh, for having to have that happen because mm -hmm. hazardous cleanup is very expensive. Right. Um, so, okay. All right. Um, I think that's it. I think that's it for now. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Chief. Thank you, Councilor. Anyone else before we send this to public safety? <laughs> Councilor Fowell, I'd entertain a motion. Yes, I would like to move that this uh, resolve be forwarded to the Public Safety Committee. Second. 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 Okay. Uh, the only problem we're going to have with that, Councillor, is we're going to have to send it back to Council and then do it because we can't send from a committee to a committee. So what I would... Uh, move, move favorable recommendation back to the Council. Second. Second. Just so, Councillor, so you understand that, we'll send this back to Council Monday night. We will then take a vote to refer it to Public Safety. Uh, motion made and seconded to recommend favorably to the full City Council. All those in favor? All those opposed, recommended favorably to the full city council. Item number seven. Resolve that Mr. Matt O'Brien, Mr. Like Bill Keene, and Mr. Joe Berlo Berlini, representatives of the West Cal Ripken Baseball League, FKA West Little League, be invited to appear before the Finance Committee to discuss the history of the Albert Barrosalli baseball field and the need and desire to have a new baseball field constructed to meet the needs of the youth within our city. Council Sullivan. Mr. Chairman, a uh, point of information, as you know, this was a very successful resolve and I do want to just share with my colleagues, I went to the, the baseball banquet two Fridays ago at the VFW oh, and nice. I must have been stopped by 20 parents that thanked this body for having this resolve. It was long overdue. And with that being said, I, th I think it'd be appropriate to postpone it until the first FinCom in February. Um, of course, the legislative session doesn't extinguish, so it's going to carry on. That will give us some time uh, with the individuals that came before us and also uh, the mayor who represented to us that he's going to work with us on this matter. So I'd like to make a motion to postpone to the first FinCom in February. Second. 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 Motion made and seconded to postpone to the first finance meeting in February. All those in favor? All those opposed? Recommended for, uh, to the, uh, excuse me, remanded to the first finance in February. Uh, before we finish, Councillor Sullivan, I believe the chairman. there is a tradition. If I could take a moment of personal privilege. You may. It's been 11 years that you and I have served on this esteemed body, and I think I've done this every, uh, every election cycle. But tomorrow is one of the most important elections that this country has faced. And I am going to urge everybody to please go to the polls, do your civic duty. Here in the city of Brockton, the polls are open 7 a.m. to 8 p.m., I also want to thank John McGarry and his staff yes. for the early voting at the Westgate Mall. I went up there and I voted. It was professional. It was prompt. It was excellent. It really was. So, again, if you could please go to the polls tomorrow, it's extremely important. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Councilor Beauregard. I'd like to take a personal point of privilege. Actually, I thought someone else would say this, but um, Friday is Veterans Day. There's a whole lot of veterans uh, recognition activities going on this 
week, whether we're at the Council on Aging on one day or Broughton School System on another or Friday, when, whether it's laying the wreaths or what have you. And we have the honor of serving with a couple of veterans on the City Council. But uh, let's remember we're able to vote because of these individuals and their sacrifices. So, I And Council, thank you for pointing that. out that we do have some veterans on this Council and I thank you on behalf of the Council for your service. Hey. Thank you. Right, right, Mr. Chairman. Councilor Stodowski. Just to let everybody know, Wednesday morning at 9, it's the Council on Aging. There's a the veterans breakfast. They have a dedication. They have a singing trooper there. Trooper Clark, retired. So good. Thursday morning at Brockton High School, they have the patriotic music. All the veterans, all the veterans are invited. It's quite a show and fantastic music. That happens. Best to get there about 9 to get a good seat, I guess would be the way to say it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Council. Mr. Chairman, since Council? we're on the Veterans Day um, event, uh, Texas Roadhouse honors veterans every Veterans Day. So on Friday, um, they are doing a special, um, they have a special event. There's some singing and, um, you know, they're serving our veterans at 11 o'clock at Texas Roadhouse up at uh, Westgate Mall. Thank you. Anyone else? Thank you very much. We're adjourned.